Hi guys. Well, it is a gorgeous night here in the end times in paradise. And we are somewhere outside of West Bumblefuck, New Mexico. And, and guys, uh, Humpty Dumpty tried hero, hero history is being made here tonight. Whoever would have thought this night was going to happen out of the blue. Guys, it, it, is, it, is my, it is my great pleasure to introduce from right here in the Mud Hut a moment that, uh, was this ever going to happen? The universe has put it together. Guy McPherson, guys, it, it has happened. Uh, who would ever, who'd ever thunk it? Who would have ever thunk it? You know, and especially when, as you pointed out, <laughs> Yesterday, today, it all runs together. That only four of your 32 videos when you mentioned me, only four <laughs> did you actually insult, disparage, and slander me. So only four, with, only, with a well, record like that, why would A I lot of people you? are 28 out of 32, guys. Anyway. A lot of people are none for 32. <laughs> Those are the people I generally talk to. That, that's true. It's, and, 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 and guys, all right, we're, we're, we're going to... I'm going to break from the normal Humpty Dumpty tribe uh, tradition of the interview. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Guy McPherson. I don't know if Guy has ever watched one of my videos since the day this man was born. I, I have no clue what, the, what this man actually knows about me on any level. Uh, I, watched, but, I watched parts of one or two. What he's he's watched parts of one or two of my five thousand videos in the in the past eight years. You have as many as Paul Beckman. I have a lot more than Paul. I have five. That's something because nearly five thousand of these. Five thousand of these. around shooting himself with his own video. I have five thousand of these. Uh, and and I'm not going to repeat anything I have ever said. Anybody who who knows me. No, no, knows there have been a few moments in, in my eight-year history that I have uh, that 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 I have become exasperated with this man, and uh, I'm not. So what was the worst guy? What was the worst? Did, I, I want you. I want you to, no, 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 to no, no, whatever you, you want to do, brother. I this is your what opportunity. Do, what I want to do is tell you, <laughs> have you tell me what's the worst exasperation you experienced in my direction. The worst exasperation, I, I think, and I apologize. That I, I've only called him a fucking idiot one time in my life, and I did apologize. Just as this man, when he called me an asshole. He apologized when I called him a fucking idiot. I did come back and apologize for I apologize for that? You did. Wow. You wrote a very nice a apology day. like uh, to, to me after you called me an asshole and, and put me on the map. I was, I was a complete unknown, even more of an unknown than I am now. And then Guy McPherson called me an asshole. And, they, and when I first started this, channel and uh, and I went from like my, my usual 50 views a day to 7,000 views and so for eight years I've been trying to provoke this man to call me an asshole again to get 7,000 hits yeah. on one of my and he's never done it well, you're as hard as that. I've tried as hard as I, but I've only tried three more times yeah well I stopped watching there you go after brother. the first time you called <laughs> after the first that was enough <laughs> No, but when I called you a fucking idiot, guy was when you said. No, we don't have to relive that part. Yeah, okay. It's all on record. It's all on right, record. Right. Anybody wants to know why? I'm why a idiot, uh, they, they, they can, can go. They, they, they well, can almost go everybody find. thinks I'm a fucking idiot, so it's not like you're in special territory. <laughs> I, I do not think this, but clearly, guys, th th this man is not a fucking idiot. Th this guy is one of my Humpty Dumpty tribe heroes. Every time I, I introduce, uh, e even, e even when I'm slandering this man, I, uh, I, 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 I state for the record. And, and that's the only reason I let this man exasperate me as much as he does, is because he, uh, he, he truly gets it. But, uh, but, but Guy McPherson, if you have anything you want to say to me or anyone on this channel who disparages you... Uh, I, I, don't, I don't even look because, you know, your channel is just emblematic of every other channel out there in terms of people not coming to grips with evidence. 
Essentially, every statement I make is backed up by evidence, and I include the link or the, the whole article or whatever. And and still, I'm subject to all these, all this horrible name calling experience and all this. He's making things up. Kind of, come on, let it go. So that's the part that drives me crazy. And your channel, like almost every other channel, has. <laughs> You know, sometimes I, I use the, the line about civilizations. A few thousand years ago, we had we had never experienced any civilization ever. There was never any stored grain grown, stored, and distributed at large scale. So for the first 2.8 million years of the genus Homo on the planet, no civilizations. And then a few thousand years ago, they started popping up like trolls on YouTube. And when I say trolls on YouTube, I think of your channel every time. <laughs> So I think that's a compliment. That, that, that on some level, for that, that on, on some level, that that is a compliment. Uh, so keep on, guy. Come, come on, know, come on, guy. I didn't, you know you need saying. to get riled up. No, no, no. no he no, would no, not let me. I, guy would not let me get a shot of tequila. I really wanted to prime to prime the pump with a couple of shots of tequila, but he's not going for it. No, no, no. I quit drinking a long time ago, and I only do it now as part of the, the show when I'm on the road. And I'm not on the road now, and this isn't part of the show. This is just a casual conversation. So let's, let's talk about how you got here to this point, to this magnificent room in the mud hut, which is for sale, by the way, if anybody's looking for an opportunity out there. Talk sorry, to me. I'm a, real, I'm a realtor. Talk to me, and we'll and we will sell you this place. So anyway. yesterday, I'm just sitting here minding my own business. This morning, actually, was it this morning? It was this morning that I waltzed into your life out of the blue. Unbelievable! <laughs> and so I'm just minding my own business, <laughs> and who walks in the door but Handball and Little Tail? <laughs> your and, nemesis. And Pauline and Sarah are right behind him, but I don't know what the hell's going on. This guy just walks in. Hey, Handball, how you doing? He gave me a hug. All right. All right, here we go, guys. Come on in, I guess, is sort of what I this, said. This, I, I, and, and, and the first thing we did, within five seconds of our eyes meeting, I gave this man a hug, just to let him know. We can uh, be civil. That we can be civil. Gen congenial about the whole thing. But I was just a little surprised to have you darken my door without any warning. And of course you found out from that. What if I had called? Would you have said, come on over or not? Yeah, you don't have my number. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect I would have said, come on over. I mean, as you saw, people just stop by in droves and find us in Belize and find me here. You know, I entertain at least hundreds, probably a thousand people here in the seven years I was living here full time. We just came to visit. So I'm always open to a conversation with anybody. Apparently. Including, including me. If you, if you have, if you have uh, reduced your your yeah, level, your bar, yeah, if you have standard, lowered your bar to hit Hamlet, my sale, standard was always that low. That's what I'm man, <laughs> I mean, you, you've gone from Bill Nye to Hamlet, Little Tail. You are on a, you know, a, a, a your, your star has fallen. People fun. say, <laughs> people say about <laughs> academics all the time that they fight over the least important issues because the stakes in academia are just that small. So I have a long history of dealing with egotistical assholes, is that the word I... That's the first I word you ever used, used to describe me. I have a long history of dealing, <laughs> dealing with, with egotistical with assholes. Like this. Yes, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's all of the academy. It's every person in a tenured faculty position. Well, I am not in a tenured faculty position. I, exclude, I know, but what I'm saying is I had a lot of practice before <laughs> I came across you. So I'm just a little, I, I'm just, by the time more, I darkened your door. You're more of the same, man. I'm just, just a little gnat for, for, for the rock star of doom to, uh, to slap down. You know, and it's not like I want us to go extinct <laughs> as a species. I have a lot of individuals who I can point to, obviously, like all of us. Does that include me or not? I'm, I'm Do you want me to go extinct? I'm no comment person. at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I can name names, but I won't name yours. After all, you can name any names. It is wide open. You, you need can to do the editing. I don't do editing on so, my... Oh, you can do an intro, you can do a I, 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 the, so, I, I'm going to try to remain civil. You can get as uncivil as you want to, brother. This is as uncivil as I want to be. You can written... I'm, I'm taking my advice here from... 
Henry David Thoreau. Okay. One of my heroes. Yeah. In terms of the civility with which I act. Even towards you. <laughs> there he, but, 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 of course he, but of course he has crossing the Rubicon in the, in the, in the mud hut next door. Uh, I, I think Sarah is borrowing that from Pauline, actually. Or from you. She borrowed from me? You. Yeah, you. Oh, okay. I already read it anyway. <laughs> All right, whatever. <laughs> I have a lot of books. I have maybe two or three thousand volumes here. I bet you have some good Bibles of the Apocalypse that I need to read. And, and they're just stored away because when I was creating this place, this homestead in southern New Mexico, I thought that I was going to live forever with my... We all did. Right. With my now ex-wife, I thought we were going to live here at least until we were a hundred years old. And all we had to do was dismantle civilization. And we'd be able to keep this keep this and now it's for healthy sale. planet going. And then along comes 2013, and I hear about the worst case scenario with respect to the absence of global dimming when civilization collapses. And I was done then. I basically gave up the gardening and growing trees in the orchard that I'd been doing for, well, since 2007, till 2013. Now, I'm, so I'm gonna tell there. a story on Guy. If, if you know our tribe's member, Mark, brother Mark, Mark Johns, we had 400 pounds of homegrown organic apples. 20 miles from here is the Hobbit House. 400 pounds of organic homegrown apples that we just picked today. And you have store-bought apples in your refrigerator? And you showed up with how many as a gift? <laughs> oh, they weren't my apples. Oh, none. Right? Did, did I get that right? You could, they weren't my apples. You could pick three apples off a fucking tree to give to the three of us. <laughs> I picked, I'm sure I picked about 12,000 apples off of a tree today since you saw me this morning, but you need to talk to Mark mm -hmm. about it. Oh, oh, yeah. It's that. not me, it's somebody else's apples. But his apples come from the store. <laughs> anyway, just, just pointing that out. Uh, well, when I, when I was on the way here, yeah. I didn't know if there would be apples on the trees, and sure enough, there aren't. Here at the mud hut, no apples. This There's year. no apples here? They're, they're nope. 20 miles from here, Mars getting 400 pounds per tree. Yeah, well, we're just a couple of miles downriver from where the Gila River yeah. changes from its canyon phase, which is how, it, how it's been its entire life in the wilderness, and then it spills out into this little valley, and the cold air drainage it slams into us here, makes it 10 degrees Fahrenheit colder every night than it is four miles down the river at the official weather station. So it's really cold here. So that's why we don't have any apples in the tree this year. It's, it's actually... And so 20 tree miles tree. from here, there's 400 pounds per tree. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. In fact, probably five miles further down the river from here, yeah. there's lots of apples in the tree. But so what's a, the takeaway message from all this? Guy? Takeaway yeah. message is in the in the midst of abrupt climate change when we're all truly fucked. <laughs> if if you could have brought me an apple, it would have been <laughs> sort of a show of peace. <laughs> oh no no no! I, that's, not, I, that's not the takeaway message. I <laughs> put twelve thousand apples at the bar at the back of Mark's gas sucking truck. He, <laughs> you talked to Brother Mark about uh, I, we had we had eight fifty pound boxes. Why? Uh, but. but the, the, the message here, my message here, what is your message? the same as always. It is. In the in the midst of the sixth mass extinction on planet Earth, mm -hmm. in the midst of abrupt climate change, leading to human extinction within a very short period of time. At the edge of extinction, only love remains, and that's what we're having this conversation. It, it must be for. Uh, so all kidding aside, guys, who, whoever I wasn't thought kidding about that. Who, oh, whoever thought this would have happened. Uh, this this man has been nothing but absolutely gracious to me since the moment I walked in this door, and uh, so I've held it together for ten or twelve hours. <laughs> You've it's held it together. Bad. Not we only about, about we've known each other for about seven hours. hours, but we had to take five <laughs> hours apart. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice break too. I guess. Yes, yes. <laughs> so we're not gonna we're not gonna talk about what happened during during the break. 
Oh, did you interview? <laughs> no, no. I, 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 I've been, I've been picking apples today. I don't know what you've been up to today. I went to right? town and ran a few errands and ran into people who don't really appreciate me. <laughs> but that happens everywhere. As it turns out. <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling. You know. know hey, feeling. aren't you Guy McPherson? <laughs> yes, I am. I hate you. Okay. Now, now. <laughs> I just heard you pronounce your name, Guy McPherson. Yeah, that was a mistake. Well, how do you pronounce your damn you, name? You didn't right? really hear that. See, your hearing's going 58 years old. I understand. <laughs> is your name McPherson or McPherson? Yes. It is and how come you just said McPherson when I, you were talking? I just wanted to start this conversation to completely distract our, our watchers. <laughs> because this, this seems to be a major controversy. I know. People love <laughs> to have a. People love to pronounce it McPherson. Because of your fear. Yeah, I, that, yeah, message, yeah, yeah, yeah right? I get it. I get Even it. though my message is no fear, no hope. There's the twin size of the head of the future coin. Technically, as is pointed out to me all the time when I run into people from Scotland, it's pronounced McPherson. But I heard it my whole life McPherson, McPherson, McShut the fuck up, son, all kinds of things. So I but what me, is it? It's McPherson. McPherson. I've been doing it. I've been. Yeah. McPherson, technically, but I grew up pronouncing it, McPherson, pronouncing it incorrectly, McPherson. You've been pronouncing your own name because okay. I, ran, I ran into a, a, shall we say, a, 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 a former friend of yours, and I got in this argument with, with this man yesterday about how you pronounce your name, and, mm -hmm. I, and I said, God damn it, I know how he pronounces his name, it's McPherson, uh -huh. and, and, and I got it. Well, my but, best behavior, when I have time to think about it, I pronounce it McPherson, but... 57 years of cultural programming has been pronouncing my own name incorrectly. That's a sad testimony. Actually, it's a sad testimony to the entire culture. But my dad always pronounced it McPherson. My mom always pronounced it McPherson. So this is, all, this is what I heard growing up. And then it was pointed out to me, I don't know, five or ten years ago, that that's not right. Some pronounce it McStinction. Oh, yes. McStinction. <laughs> it's Dr. McStinction to you, Missy. <laughs> Extinction. I have, I have not heard that one. Oh yeah, you know, I was introduced to the terms. I was on tour, this was four or five years ago, and I'm chatting, and I don't remember who it was with, and, and this woman says, you probably know this already, but I think it's hilarious. I don't know how you take it, but do you know what people call you? People's nickname for you? And I said, well, there's a lot of nicknames for me, and most of them we can't say. What's the best on one? The and she says, I think this is funny. I'm sure you've heard this before. Everybody around here calls you Guy McStinction. Makes sense. And I just well, I like it. I don't know. I've never heard it. I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. I never heard it before. She assumed that I that I'd heard it, that I was familiar with it. That was the first time I heard it. I thought it was awesome. My favorite for me is hairball. <laughs> so by the way, we got the H B right. So uh, I've been it's usually T bone that people are calling me, but <laughs> but hairball was, was no, my, no, my, my, was my bone. personal favorite. What's that? No because of sandbone. Well, yeah, some people do because my, my name is, by the way, guys, my name is Sam. So anyway, for, for people who do not know this about me, so not many people know what my name is. Pushing it together, Sam and Hambone, Sam Bone. Uh, so you never, yeah. took a, you never took a pen name. I did, actually. My first work of fiction was published under the name Mac Brothers. Oh, really? Okay. How was that? My uh, brother and I were both yeah. called Mac when we were okay, kids yeah. growing up. Okay. You know, his last name was McPherson. Okay. So we were both called Mac, and we collaborated on this book, which is called Academic Pursuits. And it's it's about, a fictional book yeah. called Academic Pursuits. There you go. And, and basically, <laughs> I wrote it as therapy when I took... How old were you? I, well, see, it was 1999-2000 when I took that leave of absence, so I was... 39 and 40. I started writing when I was 40. It was published probably when I was 42 or 43. And, and I took a leave of absence from the University of Arizona, went and became the inaugural director of the Smith Conservation Program with the Nature Conservancy. And I thought I would discover people who were really passionate about environmentalism. And at the Nature Conservancy. Yeah, at the Nature Conservancy. And I found out that really it was just more of the same. It's all about the money. So here it is, academic pursuits. By the so Brothers, right there. I wrote this as therapy because it didn't turn out like I thought it would. Like I, I was idealistic about how it turned out. I thought Give it was us the, the, the 50 word summation of uh, academic pursuits. Read the back 
Observant visitors to college campuses are frequently surprised, amused, or aghast at the cultural environment. Uh, I am to this day. Yes. Yet few books describe university life with <laughs> honesty and humor. Academic pursuits follows the trials and tribulations of a dedicated professor at a major university, professor of journalism Gary Peterson, and that field was chosen because my brother is a journalist, was a practicing journalist, and then became a professor of mass communications at a small liberal arts college. So we, we had something in common yeah. there. But his efforts are confounded by his own political ineptitude. That's all me. That one's all you, not your brother. Absolutely. <laughs> political ineptitude. Political shenanigans, personal illness, and the general chaos of life on campus constantly interfere with his sincere efforts to balance his obsession with work with his love for life. There you go. And I'm in the same place today, by the way, as I was when this book was published in... in... 2006. Oh, so I wrote it. You got a new one. I wrote it. You didn't get it on Amazon. Amazon.com or not? I have no idea where to find it. Yes. Amazon. Amazon? There you go. All right. All right. Amazon.com. And we have a new one. And I think it's never, kind never of funny. Of it's How pretty, are you and your brother getting along now? Pretty thinly veiled account of me and my professorial life and my leave of absence to go try something different, because that's what the protagonist does as well. He just discovers that his idealism is unfounded. So you and your brother did write this together? Well, I wrote it. He edited it heavily and pointed out to me that, yeah, that I got the journalism down. parts right and got this part wrong and blah, blah, blah. So it was really a collaborative effort. I did most of it. But he was really good at something called mergematics. They're, these things are hilarious, by the way. We, you merge two, two movie titles or book titles and then write a short description of it. So for example, the first mergematic here is Night of the Living Dead Poet Society. <laughs> I get it. So yeah. Night of the Living Dead yeah, Poet yeah, Society. Yeah. And then the description is a mid-career professor in the humanities continuously relives the same poor performance in the classroom as much to his own chagrin as that of his students. So that's the plot the, <laughs> of the Night of the Living Dead Poet Society. So how many, how many copies of this book have you sold? Guy, do you, are you keeping tabs? Oh no. Where do you I, place them? And I've never kept tabs of any of the books I sold, and you know all, the, all my recent publishers have gone extinct. They've all gone bankrupt. So I haven't seen a, a royalty payment for at least three years, probably. Do you have a new book in the works? I do, and if the phrase "dummy's guide" weren't copyrighted, yeah, it would be "dummy's guide to extinction" or "dummy's well, guide extinct, to extinction." A, a, Extinction for dummies. Yeah, yeah, it would be so. So are you working on that now? Yeah, and it's just a, it's a short version of my message with a profound emphasis, not on the science, but on how we respond to the terminal diagnosis. So the working title at this point is the same as the working title of Pauline's next documentary film. It's only love remains. Dancing at the Edge of Extinction. That's after the colon? Yeah. Dancing at the Edge of Extinction is after the colon. So what, to explain dancing at the edge of extinction? Well, to the five or six people listening to this. There's, <laughs> there's several responses to our terminal diagnosis. We all received a terminal diagnosis at birth. Most of us realize that by the time we're 12 years old. How do you act in light of that diagnosis? Some people especially later in their lives, if they, if they receive a reminder of the terminal diagnosis, some people become depressed. Some people go through Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief. I'm halfway through. And some people live more fully and actually dance. So dancing at the edge of extinction is one response, the response that I've chosen to take. So you can throw all the shit at me you want. You can disparage me, you can libel me, you can slander, you can do character assassination. <laughs> and people have been doing that with great aplomb for the last But it keeps your name in the, in the, in the limelight. I wanted to retire. I wanted to step <laughs> back from the public eye. And apparently somebody didn't think that was a great idea for me. So I'm back in the public eye and, and defending myself. But at the same time, I'm dancing. I'm spending my time with lovely people like Sarah and Pauline and the people I meet on the road. I as my name was not mentioned. In that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and dancing with the people I love. I'm spending the time in Belize and the homestead with the people I love. And, 
and living joyously with what, with the time we have. And that's been, if you look through history, that's been a common response by people who receive terminal diagnosis, is that they live more fully, they dance more, they breathe more, they smell the smells they never smelled before, the sweet smells that they were never noticed before. And so that's my response. And so this next book, which is going to be short, maybe 35,000 words, is my description of how I'm doing that and, and maybe serving as, as an example for how other people can do, can do that as well. All right. Although, so far. Now, I remember, I think it was about one year, I would have to look it up. I bet it was pretty close to one year ago, my, my rant was, is this Guy McPherson's suicide note? Oh, yeah. That's when... Is that one of the two you listened to? That was when I wrote, and it was just... And it sounded Rupert. like you were signing off. I honestly right. did not know if you were getting ready to, do, to go Michael Rupert. Right, right. Even though I said in the essay that, that this is not a suicide note. Is that the one well, that you're almost done? Yeah. Yes. Almost done. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And so... But you acted and, like we were never going to hear from you again, right? Well, I, so, that's, that's coincident with my move to Belize. And that's what I wanted to do. And had then, you already moved when you wrote that? Yeah. That like signing off? Like, you, were, you were already down there, yeah. right? It was about it a was, year ago? It was in August. Oh, was, August. oh, oh yeah, August that's right. Yeah, I, I was, okay, yeah, yeah. I was so I had been in Belize for a while yeah, yeah, and yeah, I yeah, discovered yeah. that the telecommunications network was terrible, so I wasn't able to update my essay, my long climate change summary and update essay. It was now 32,000 words or something like that. So well, you had that stopped. attached to the, you, you had your smaller which sounded kind of like a suicide note, right? right. And you had you said, right. This Basically. is the last. This is the last time I've said every way we can say we are so fucked, exactly. and there's no, there's no more ways I can say it. I'm signing off, and that was a year and two months ago, and we haven't been able to shut the man up since. Right. And in fact, so what happened? In fact, over, over the course of the next year, yeah. I almost doubled my output. I know it. Because I just discovered that when I when I relaxed and didn't put a deadline on myself and didn't post every two days as I'd been doing for a couple of years, yeah. that I actually was inspired to write more mm -hmm. frequently and write more meaningfully. I think mm -hmm. about the terminal diagnosis. So I I sort of pulled back again, or said I would, a couple of months ago, and I thought that that time I was serious about it. And then the character assassination endeavors began. So I've been spending way too much time trying to point out that, that people are not actually guilty until proven innocent. And that I, I've given a lot of evidence indicating that that all that bullshit that people like Mike Sleva and Corey Morningstar and Derek Jensen and Forrest Palmer, and I can name a whole bunch more names they're spewing, is just abject lies. I, you, so notice, you, know, you know this guy's my name was not, was, was, was I, I'm, right, this is the wrong My name is at, for once, not on this list. The Air Keith, Keith I, 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 No, you're I not have, on that list. I, 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 have, uh, I have publicly <laughs> proclaimed my uh, position on this. So, so <laughs> those people drew me back in because I felt an obligation to defend myself. And the attorneys that Pauline hired to work on my behalf said that I was certainly right, that they all broke the law. I, I, guys, I am, I'm going to let the man go on here. You just, you just, you just, this, this so you have your, you have your So soon, 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 I think I'm going to take seriously my own retirement. Uh. You know, <laughs> I've actually concluded the terminal diagnosis. I don't think I have two years, perhaps only a year, because of an ice cream arctic. Now, now guy, okay, all right, right, can I? And so what this means for me is I need to scale back and spend time doing things I love with the people I love. And that has nothing to do with me defending my so-called honor <laughs> to a bunch of liars and hypocrites. Uh, I, I, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank I, you very I, much. I'm, I'm just going to try. I love doing this before a live studio audience. Uh, yes, uh, nice. as I say, with the five or six people on the planet listening <laughs> to this conversation. Uh, now, I, I want you to give me a little bit of credit that it was back in June, before he ever went on the, on the fucking Gary Null show, that you told me, we were talking about me coming down to Bay Lease, 
and 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 you said that I needed to. I was saying, well, I'll come down there in January, and you were telling me, well, Hambo, you ain't gonna come down here in January because we're we're all fucked by October. Well, it's yeah. now November. So what yeah. happened? So, I mean, I'm very glad you were wrong, brother. What I, what I'm I'm glad you're not extinct. But what, what I tell happened? what I tell people personally, okay, not for on the air. Well, so you're on the air. So yeah, before I you know. say this, so, before you wait, say wait, this, wait, wait, wait. before you say this, you're on the air. I know I'm on the air. Okay, but that was a private conversation between the two of us, and I and, and not to be shared in public. And I did like not. you've just done. By the way, <laughs> but you've come out on the Gary Nolso and with and with Sandy, so you've come out publicly with it. No, what I told you and what I told them was very different. What I told them was something like, "I can't imagine we have beyond October." What I told you was more affirmative. I was making a prediction, a personal prediction to you, and it was a personal note. What I was saying in public with Gary Knoll and with Sandy told us was that. I'm pretty strong, I'm pretty convinced that we're headed for an ice free Arctic this year. But I did not make the prediction like I did with you personally. And so what I do with people individually, personally, is I go deeper and I present what I think is a more dire outcome than what I present in public, believe it or not. And so in public, I said, it's, I, I'm, I feel pretty strongly that we are not going to have ice in the Arctic Ocean, or at least we're going to have less than a million square kilometers of ice in the Arctic Ocean in September. And I was stunned that it didn't happen. I was absolutely stunned because you start looking at June, and then you're looking at it in July. So what happened? It, the, one, the refreeze began sooner than expected, sooner than it's ever done in recorded history. So the refreeze started early. Interestingly, the October didn't add any more volume. Yeah. Through the whole month, so it's so just holding steady. It's just holding steady. Yeah. The multi-year ice is effectively gone. We were we were one storm away, one serious storm away from removing all the Arctic ice, and I'm I'm pleasantly surprised that we made it through another year. We are very America. pleasantly surprised we did too. So uh, so what's your prediction for next October? Are you going to well, go there publicly on this? No. Right now, for the five no, that's why people I said, listening to I, this. That's why I said, <laughs> I suspect we have a year or two. Okay, so you, I you suspect put, you put, I, I'm going to have to right. go back and listen to your Gary Nall and your, and, and your Sandy. Because I'm very careful in what I say, and people turn that around on me all the time and say, he made this prediction, and I didn't. Ah. Listening comprehension is very poor in this culture. There, there you go, especially after in a any couple event, of margaritas. You know, there's the paper in Earth and Planetary Sciences, the review paper from 2012, predicting an ice-free Arctic in 2016 plus or minus three years. So I'm stunned we've dodged five bullets. Can we dodge two more? I would be stunned again. And we're going into this next year with the, into the refreeze season, and the refreeze is falling apart already, with really, really low ice volume. And ice yeah. volume is critical yeah. here, far more important than yeah, 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 yeah. So I suspect that next year, or the year after that, 2018 or 2019, which fits into the 2016 plus or minus three years. It's difficult for me to imagine, and here again, I'm not making a prediction. It's okay. difficult for me to he's, imagine we get to 2019. not making a prediction. But, but other people it's difficult are, to imagine. Which, Paul yeah. Beckwith and Peter Wadhams are making that prediction for an ice free Arctic, and they don't think that we're as screwed as I think we are in light of that ice free Arctic, but they are making that prediction. So I think we don't have long, that's my point. And so I'm trying to live more fully in what I think is a very short time we have left. And especially me living where I live, so close to the equator. You know, during heating events, the habitat is lost first at the equator, and the poles hold out life a little bit longer. So why are you choosing to live down there instead of where Paul Beckwith does? Uh... Well, I'm making a joke here, just to be clear. Okay. That's... I'm not living where Paul Beckwith does because Paul Beckwith is there. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was guy McPherson humor, Paul. In case I ever interview you, I, you know, this is his rant. This is not mine, Paul. In once, case you're listening to again, it. once I found out about global dimming and how powerful it is, and how much the planet will heat up after the system implodes, and and you like I. 
have uh, have this feeling that it's not long into the future before the system implodes. But it, just for the the out of the five or six people watching this, for the two people who don't know what global dibbing is, give us just. Okay. Real quickly, give me, give us the, the so scenario. That you're at the same talking time, industrial about. civilization puts yeah. greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which trap heat and hold it close to the surface. Yeah. At the same time, industrial civilization does that. Civilization also produces particulates that go up in the sky and act as an umbrella that yeah, prevent yeah, 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 incoming yeah, radiation yeah. from even getting into the atmosphere. So, if we take the umbrella down by most notably by stopping burning poor quality coal coal high in sulfates, which puts sulfate or aerosols into the atmosphere. We stop burning those in a matter of weeks, a few weeks. And certainly within a few mm -hmm. weeks, all the sulfates fall out and the planet heats up. So you're saying we should burn, burn more low-quality coal? No, although that's what uh, Michael Manning implied in an interview with Tom Hartman a year or two ago. That He, he says, when asked, what do we do? He said, well, we can't stop burning coal. So here's the, the, the leading climate scientist of the world <laughs> I'll, I'll who, have to. who encourages us to burn more coal. Well, wasn't Paul so, Beckwith encouraging war, nuclear war between India or Pakistan or not? That's the first thing I want to ask that man. Well, and he was also suggesting that we fire off hydrogen bombs in the world's deserts. So yeah, just to put the up into the sky. The, the human, the anthropogenic uh, volcano. This is, this is just a few steps beyond So Paul, Vietnam. if I ever interview you, we're going to talk about the anthropogenic volcano. So this is a few steps beyond the Vietnam era statement bombing the village to save it. What Paul would have us do is bomb the planet to save it. <laughs> Seem a little paradoxical. You know, we got to yeah. think outside of the box here, uh, about, here in, the, in these desperate okay. ends. So let's think, to, let's think outside the box. Let's think. Let's outside, think outside of the box. Think right here. Let's let's box box We're going to hatch away right tonight. We're going to hatch away to save the planet. Let's think, think outside, outside the, the box. Human okay, bro. Box. The human. We're all about humans. Everybody we are I talk to humans. says we need to save habitat for humans. And like every species goes extinct, instead of including a half a dozen of of, of the species within the genus Homo, half a dozen of our very closest relatives have already gone extinct. Yes, sir. And so why is it all about us? Of course we're going to go extinct. Of course it'll be faster than we expect because look at the sort of behavior that, that people practice. Like the people I was talking about in the restaurant today. <laughs> of course we're going to go extinct. We're, we're mean. We're incredibly self-absorbed. We don't think about any other species. We think nothing. What do we call those other species? We call them resources. We call everything a resource. But, but you said it's never a relationship. relationship. Do you or do you not support the extinction of the human race? Of course not. Oh, I've really? said this repeatedly. Oh, I do support it. So I've that's said this repeatedly. Me and I'm not a fan of human extinction. Oh, really? I'm a huge fan of a, of a bunch of people dying. <laughs> and I'm not going to give you that list, by the way. Because <laughs> then if they show up the dead, uh, yeah, so, you know, the deep state You know, one of these it. numbers that's always batted around, okay, where do you fall on the Thomas mouth? Is how many people can this planet support and, and have humans coexist with... with no, you know, our other fellow reflection. You gonna, have a number. A I'm going to do what I always do, which okay. is refer to the science conducted by somebody else. Okay. Let's hear your you number. Know, before civilizations arose, yeah. there was maybe a half a million or a million people on the planet. It's a little hard to tell. Because so between 500,000 and yeah. not, and one, not yeah. 500 million and 1 billion, you're yeah. saying 500,000 and 1 million? Yeah. And, and it might have been more. We don't know. Nobody's so you think that's a good number? No. Oh. That was before civilization. Since, <laughs> since civilization came along and destroyed the top, topsoil and ruined the water, you know, you can't drink any water anymore. Yeah. Certainly not right out of the ground. I, back, when there were, back when, even when there were a billion people on the planet, there were a lot of rivers you could drink right out of. When I was a kid, and I know that you love stories that start like that, when I was a kid, we would stop at a stream and just drink out of a, oh, out yeah. out oh, of yeah. a soup can. Somebody yeah, I remember. Oh, 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 yeah, we're the same age. I remember. Almost any stream. Until we were about eight years old. Yeah, and, and then all you that can't shit do changed. That and it changed you about go. 50 years ago, didn't it? And so Paul Chaferka, who has done a fairly detailed analysis of human care right. today. I've not heard this name. Chaferka? Chaferka. C H E F U R. C-H-E-F-U-R-K-A. -E Remember that Paul name? Chaferka. I'll put him and on my list. He did this analysis, and I think it appeared on his blog. 
in which he concludes, given the state of the yeah, planet yeah, today, yeah, yeah. we can't support anywhere near what we could back in the good old days. So what's his number? So I'm trying to remember his number, and it seems like it was in the tens of thousands, plus or minus a few tens of thousands. Well, Bill Burr was, is 20,000. Bill Burr says 20,000 you know, is the ideal human he's a population. Comic. I'm not sure that he's that has the credentials. Well, I think he might have been reading the same research you were. Well, maybe so. In any event, <laughs> Chaperka initially said 10, like 30,000 or something like that, plus or minus 15,000. I, I like remember so the far. exact number. So a pretty small number, compared, but then he said, in yeah. light of abrupt climate change, we're done. Can't even support that many. And, and even them, they're, they're going to be growing bananas at the North Pole <laughs> or the South Pole. In what? There's no soil to support growing yeah, bananas. South Pole. We're going to take the soil up there from the banana growing? You know, one of the things that most people fail to understand is the intricate relationship between the soil and the microbes and the fungi and the plants. And without that intricate web, you don't have the plants. Yeah. You can't go stick yeah. plants in sand and boom, they're yeah. just thriving everywhere. You know, they need a whole bunch of stuff that most people aren't aware they need. So, so, they, so a lot of people think we can just take a, take a banana seed and, and stick it, and stick it in the South Pole in the two, year right. 2030. And, and, and two years later, we've got bananas all over the place. Right. That's not correct. That ain't going to happen that way. No, yeah, I don't think so. Damn it. That was my plan. That was <laughs> my plan. Well, that's sort of the, the seed vault at Svalbard. That's that plan. Right? Things get bad enough. We'll be able to What is your opinion of the Doomsday over. Seed Vault, particularly in light of the news from last year when it flooded after 11 years? Yeah, you know, <laughs> one of the things it was designed for, by the way, was climate change. <laughs> And, and the first significant climate change even comes uh, along and it just floods the, the doorway, the passageway. <laughs> into Every engineer knows that there's only three important principles you need to pay attention to when designing structure like a road or a building or a seed vault. You know what the three are? Mass here. Um, drainage, drainage, and drainage. And, and, and we're, we're missing all three in the, exactly. in the doomsday seed vault. <laughs> that, that, I have to, that was one of my favorite stories of... That, that was a true... If that's not enough to convince you that yeah. we are a clever ape, but not a wise ape, and the, therefore the, we're going extinct, then what is it going to take? The melting of the, do yeah, with the melting of the doomsday seed vault, that doesn't pull your head out of your ass, guys. I don't know what. Uh, it, what is it going to take I think before the, humanity to pull its head out of it? I think the done. last human... Yeah. Before he takes he or she the takes last the last one on the planet. planet. There will be a last human on this of planet. Of course. And so what's he gonna be thinking about? Let's say it's a let's say it's a man. <laughs> okay, if it's a man, he's if gonna it's be a man, thinking about just you know use what? The word he. Yeah. He's gonna <laughs> moments before he takes his last breath. I know what he's, he's gonna, thinking about. He's gonna overcome his craniorectal inversion. <laughs> he's gonna pull his head out of his ass. Yeah. He's gonna look around, he's gonna it's, take his last breath, and he's gonna deny climate change. Uh, is that gonna be the last uh, that's gonna be the last thought. And, and what if the last human of what I believe is gonna be a female? I think the last million humans are all gonna be female. So what is the last female on the planet gonna be thinking about? She's gonna be going. Damn, it's nice without all those men around. <laughs> Finally have some time to read and do some scholarly work. Not being pushed into the kitchen. The dominant culture isn't forcing me to do all these stupid things. There you go. I, I am totally convinced that the women will outlive the men on this. Uh, on this uh, well, they tend yeah. to do that generally anyway. Yes, yes they do. Yes they so. do. Anyway, we're all going to die and people hate it when I tell them that. Uh, but they've known that since they were 10, maybe 12. You know, you do that. When? I remember. I remember I was 11 when my grandmother died. And I barely knew the woman, but, yeah. but oh, I cried for that, a while. That's funny how you, yeah, it's almost identical to my life story. Yeah. 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 And then it took me years to realize I wasn't crying for her. I was crying for me. Yeah. Because she reminded me that I, too, am mortal. I knew that everybody else was, but I didn't think it applied to me. And so she reminded me that I was mortal and made me really sad for a while. But I was 11, and then, you know, I got over it. So you've gotten over it? Yeah, I don't... You know the, the, the shit that they spewed my way? Some days I welcomed that last breath. <laughs> Just so I could be done with it. And also, I've had a great run, like you. I've had a great run. You know, we 
We grew up in this period of economic expansion when people who look like us can make money hand over fist, enjoy lives of enormous privilege without really working terribly hard compared to yeah. our ancestors from just a few generations back. So I've had a great run. And I'm living Can't complain. No, not at all. And I'm living very fully. I've had these great experiences. Would I like a little longer? Of course. Doesn't everybody who's reasonably healthy say that? And I'm reasonably healthy. You know, I don't have I don't take any pills ever during the day. For a person fifty seven years old who's about to be fifty eight, that's pretty uncommon. Most most people in this culture are popping pills left and right. I take a sleeping pill every night. I do. I'm I take one one every day. So maybe maybe when I'm you know fifty nine and the Arctic ice has gone away, maybe I'll take fifteen or twenty sleeping pills. <laughs> <laughs> do you seriously do you do you have a suicide pact? I don't. You don't? And it's something that I've been pondering only within the last year and thinking about it and talking about it with the people on the homestead in Bailey. Yeah. Because there's six or eight adults living there. And in how many of them have a suicide pact? And there's no suicide pact. There's not even a suicide No, I mean, no, I, no, not pact. I mean the pills. Oh, no, no. To my knowledge, no. Oh, no? Because oh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm meeting more and more people who, I, I used to have one, but I don't mm -hmm. want to do. Mm -hmm. I'll let mine go. Yeah. And so I can easily imagine the day when I want to commit suicide. And one of the things I did here in New Mexico at the Mud Hut was try to grow poppies. So, you mean opium poppies? Yeah. Yeah. So because all painkillers yeah, essentially come yeah, from yeah. Are opiates yeah. in one form or another. But I couldn't grow them well here. I never got them to the stage that well, I could really, help I them. Think, I think they would look great right here. Well, you would think so. And I tried everything I could think of anyway. It didn't pan out. So. So I think about ending my life, something that I that I haven't done since I was a teenager. You know, we are, I think most people go through that teenage angst, especially the more privileged among us, oddly enough. And we think about suicide, but I wouldn't say it was really serious then. And so for the first time within the last year, I've been thinking about it. What will I do when civilization falls? It's probably as a result of an ice-free Arctic, causing that methane burst. So. I know that what faces me is an essentially lifeless planet, you know, without trees, and I live in the jungle. And do you want to okay. hang around for that? Well, exactly. So I think about it now. Do I really want to hang around to see a lifeless planet? Oh. Do, I want to, do I want to live through nights that I can't hear the howler monkeys? Oh. That I can't hear the occasional jaguar growling during the night? And, and right now, I think, no, I don't, want to, I don't want to live through that. I don't want to live to see that. But I haven't taken that the next step and come up with a pack of pills that I'm going to take to terminate my life. And part of this is, you know, there's a wonderful book by Sarah Perry called Every Cradle is a Grave with cover art by Jack Kevorkian, a human skull with an orchid growing up through Do you know, I, I have it in my car. Oh, you do? Do you know that a, 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 a Humpty Dumpty Tribes member, are you believing this, Nona? Your, uh, your daughter's book is being recommended. I have it in oh, my no, trunk. No. Nona writes to me all the time. Yeah, Nona is, is Sarah's mother. Yeah, she's know? great. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Nona gave, gave, me a, gave me that book, and I have it in my car. I have not cracked it because I'm reading The Water Thief instead. She gave me The Water Thief. Well, we interviewed Sarah Perry for the radio show, and it's a wonderful book that really makes you consider the importance of life, your own life, the importance or lack thereof of bringing more life into the planet. Yeah. And so it's just very thoughtfully done. And what she does is she goes through some of the reasons we don't regularly commit suicide. She points out that a lot of people would if they, if they weren't afflicted with body envelope issues. You know, we hold... We what is a body envelope issue? Well, to find that term. The, I haven't in, heard that one yet. In this culture, it, we, we see images of people getting killed and their body envelope breaks, right? They get shot in the head yeah, and it's suicide. Yeah, 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 and it's all like, ooh, yeah, yeah. ooh that's nasty. Yeah, yeah. So that's a body envelope issue. Our response to that it's is, ooh, that's horrible, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're disgusted, we don't want that to happen to us. So she says this is one of the reasons. And there are other reasons. Um, people, a, a significant, a small but significant number of people who attempt to commit suicide fail. Including Sarah. Is that right? 
I didn't know that. I, I, Nona, are you okay with me saying this? Uh, I don't know that. Let's not go there. Yeah, yeah. Really, really I better. mean, I don't know. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, so we don't I'm need to go there. Assumptions. But a significant number. And then their lives are even more miserable than they were before. So they were so miserable they didn't want to live any longer. They tried to kill themselves. And what they do is end up having um, quadriplegia, for example. Well, so, so now their life was miserable before. Now they came and yeah, yeah, they came yeah, and moved their arms. So now things are even worse. So she goes through brilliantly with great scholarship a variety of reasons why people don't commit suicide. And I suspect that's what's holding me back as well, because I've been subject to the dominant paradigm, to the to the to the cultural messages my whole life too. And and also there's this there's this disdain for people who attempt to commit suicide. And in, in, right. in, in this in, culture. You mean in, in attempt and fail or yeah. attempt and succeed or it doesn't Both. make any difference? Both. And especially for those who fail. You're such a failure you try to commit suicide yeah. and you're such a failure you couldn't even get that done. You know, that's well, like I think worst. people who attempt suicide and fail, they didn't try that hard. I, I've never attempted, but I, I, the, the first time I attempt suicide, you're going to succeed. I'm going to succeed. Well, if you aren't, I, I mean, it's, it's now we have a Michael. I don't think Michael Rupert attempted and failed. See, now we have it on record uh, that you're going to be a hundred percent success. I, when, when I'm ready to if go, if you fail, I, can you even imagine the embarrassment? I, I, it, 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 it would be embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's one of the reasons that people don't commit suicide is because they might actually fail. He did attempt before. He died. Michael Rupert. Mike did. Oh, really? We'll have, to, no we'll have to talk about this after. Did you ever know Michael? Did you and he ever get together? We never met in person. Uh, we, we, we talked and corresponded frequently. He interviewed me for his radio show, I think, five times. But y'all never met personally in person? No, he called me Saturday night. The night before? Yeah. Wow. On the phone. And of course, I didn't know he was calling to say goodbye. I was just stepping up to, to, a, to a podium at the University of Rhode Island. So you just had a, few, a couple of minutes? Three minutes, 48 seconds, because wow. the cell phones keep track of this. So how were you affected? I mean, I couldn't believe, I mean, I was, I, I was, I mean, I was, I, 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 it's hard for me to, to, I mean, I was stunned, guys. I, I did not see it coming. I did not see it coming. It's very rare for me to break down in tears, but he was a loss. Michael was a loss. I felt like, fuck, you know, if we lose this brother, I mean. Someday, after he finished the radio show and before he killed himself, and there's only about a half an hour in there, yeah, he sent me yeah. a message. So I wasn't terribly surprised when he committed suicide. I was sad, and I was in New York at the time, uh, being hosted on tour by this woman, and we cried. I don't, I don't know why I, I was only surprised for about three minutes. I mean, because after looking at Apocalypse Man, I mean, you were looking, you were looking. I mean, that dude had the sort of down with that, and that was filmed in November. Yeah. And he took himself out in April. Yep. Guy, you cried like a baby. All right. I just guy I cried, cried like no, a baby. No, you didn't. He, she, he, he cried like a baby in my yeah. arms. No, I, I, I was very surprised. I mean, I'm, I'm not like that. No. I broke down, man. I, I broke yeah. down. Yeah, my, my, my best friend in the world, like, you know, she thought, well, my mother had already died. Like, yeah. I didn't have a dog. Like, who, who could, you Did know? You this guy? Oh God! If, if I ever lose this little guy. Wow, this this is this little guy, man. He's he's what he's what keeps me around. This little guy right here. So anyway, I was deeply moved by Michael Rupert's death, and I had an opportunity to meet with Jack Martin a couple of years ago. That's that's the place where yeah. Mike was staying outside of Sebastopol, and I was there with my friend Paul Marcotte, who you know, and who you interviewed for this show. And we get, the three of us were talking, and so the question came up, did he really commit suicide? And you know, he was very careful, he left all these notes, yeah. and, and it looked, and he signed off differently for his radio show than he ever had before. So it looks like it, looks like he committed suicide, and Jack Martin said, I was the last person to see him alive. Yeah. I was the first person to see his, to see his brains yeah. splattered across the parking lot right there. And I'd say there's at least a 99% chance he committed suicide. 
But he says, there are dark forces, as we all know. And no, they, they I, can make I, something I, I look think, like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. They can make look, so, like, yeah, look yeah. like something we think. So, even Jack Martin, who was probably closer to him than anybody else on the planet, was withholding that, that less than 1% chance of human suicide. And when you look at how, how successful had, his life had turned at the end, yeah. you know, he had a new girlfriend, Jesse Ray. He had just signed a big, big deal with a media company, and I was going to be his first guest for that show. And so things were really pointed the direction that he'd been wanting to go for a while. And so that gives one pause. I don't doubt that he committed suicide, except for that niggling 0.01%. Uh -huh. that, that nothing is as we think it is, and we can't know the full truth. Yeah. We just can't. Oh, what a loss. What a loss. That boy, all the, his voice and Terrence's and Bill Hicks and George Carlin. Good Lord. We need these voices today, man. This is... Yeah, these are the social critics of their time, and losing their voices is sad for all of us. So who's going to fill their shoes? I don't is Guy McPherson going to... I don't think anybody has feet that big. Mine uh -huh. are size 13. Yeah. <laughs> they're still but they're not, not big enough. Uh, uh. You know, and, and I'm inspired by those people, and I wrote an essay on the blog called I Am Bill Hicks after I wrote one a year or two ago called I Am Che, because these were my inspirations. Yeah. And, and, I, and I treated them as models for my own behavior. And I fell short, of course. Of Did you ever meet Bill? No. no he Bill died, died in 92. 92, 93? Yeah, way back when. I, I didn't even, I never even heard of him until the early yeah, 2000s. Yeah, he was, all, yeah, yeah, it might be too. He'd been dead for 10 years before I ever heard his name. Yeah. Terrence, did you ever meet Terrence? Nope. Nope, there again, a case where I never heard his name until the early 2000s. I never heard of the, it. It was ago. 10 years ago this month. It was November of 2007 that my life got uh, radically reorganized. 10 uh -huh. years ago this month, I just thought of that. It was November of 2007 when I bumped in Terrence McKenna and my life has oh. never been the same. That was the end of a $100,000 a year real estate career. Real quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. When you hear these radical voices, you realize that some things are more important than others. And, and money certainly falls down the list of important topics yeah. compared to the, the way it's treated for all the rest of our lives. But do you years. miss it? Do you miss those six figures or not? Be honest. Of course, absolutely. Where you go, do you know? Time? Do you know? Hell yeah. How much touring I could be doing? How many more people I could be informing? <laughs> if I had that sort of money. If you had a hundred thousand dollars a year coming in. Of course. Well, you know, well, now I have to depend upon the kindness of strangers. That's what I depend on. To you know. get me to tour. Well, so what that means is I tour three or four times a year. So I reach a few thousand people in a year. If I was pouring my own hundred thousand dollars into the cause, yeah, uh, with a house that was paid for and very low bills and all that, geez, I could be, I could be affecting the lives for better and worse of a lot more people. <laughs> well, let me tell you how many people are are, are, are financing the Hamlin Little Tail tour. I have I have never been invited in my entire life to speak before a live group of people. It's never happened. So how does it feel being a rock star of doom? It has its moments. Good and bad? Yeah, of course. You know, it, it, as when I was teaching in the classroom, there's, there are those moments when I'm doing a presentation and everything clicks and everybody is locked on. Yeah. And, and it just, doesn't yeah. matter what I say next, yeah. they're going to be completely into it. There you go, and that's, brother. That's why yeah. I teach. Yeah. That's why I taught for all those years, was for those moments. So that's beautiful. but. Jesus Christ, it's hard work. You know, touring is not for the faint of heart. No. It's up early, it's to bed late, it's not eating for sometimes a couple of days at a time, it's doing these presentations, and it requires a huge amount of energy. Most people don't understand that I'm not, it's not a party. I'm not on vacation when I'm touring. It is brutal. Yeah, this guy, he won't drink a margarita, he won't smoke a <laughs> ball with me, nothing, man. <laughs> It is really, really, it, it requires a lot of stamina. And 
I'm 57 years old. I'm, I'm 58. Old I'm 58. I got I got four months on you. And then and then there's the the shit from the people I talked about earlier. You know, the Nicole Foss and the Lear Keats and all that whole list of, of horrible people. All the people I'm going to be interviewing the next week. Right. Or <laughs> who, make, who, who tell these terrible lies about me based on no evidence whatsoever. And that makes this rock star thing not a hell of a lot of fun. You're a, you're a cop 